Hey Acers, welcome to this week's Ace Role Playing Games Club podcast thingy, as I keep calling it, because I still haven't actually got the podcast out there. But I'm your host, Mason Emerson. I'm the creator and founder of the Ace Role Playing Games Clubs, and I'm hoping that you are getting ready to start your own Ace Role Playing Games Clubs, and you're going to reach out to me, and I'm going to help you set that up, and I'm going to teach you how to game master, so that way you can run your own stories at your own table. And part of running a story at a table is remembering that a story, and I'm going to get into this in this slide, is not a story until you run it at the table. So that is why I built this scenario builder, and I am giving this, out, I'm going to put this out there as available for anybody to really watch on YouTube, and it's also to support the upcoming Saturday bit that I'm doing for Fanex, where I'm going to teach and coach a one sheet creation workshop. So that's going to be our start and I'm going to go ahead and go through this. I'm going to try and keep our time respected and keep going on this. So first of all, who am I? I'm like I said, I'm founder of Ace Role Playing Games Club. Ace stands for Achieve, Create and Entertain. And it is a group for teenagers primarily to help you to not delete your save file early because this earth, this life is a great place to be, and we can make it better. And if you stick around, we will make it better. So come on in, join me. So I started playing RPGs about 1988, give or take. Um, 1982, if you count the, t the time that I was playing Ten Rogue, which was based on D&D, but my parents didn't know that. And I couldn't play D&D in the 80s because my parents thought it was satanic. There you go. It got, it got better. But um, I tried game mastering before 2018, but when I got Deadlands Noir in 2016, I was using it as a writing resource, and I ended up getting back into gaming because of it, and because of Savage Worlds, which you guys have heard me talk about a lot. And you saw the, the little shout-out at the beginning of the thing. I got to thank Pinnacle Entertainment Group, specifically John Goff, for this amazing scenario builder, this adventure generator that... He, that is being used it, that I use all the time for generating stories. Now I am going to pause for just a second here. Now I did finally get into it, but there was a podcast that wasn't that great. It was kind of a little bit. It was a, it was a lot more adult than I what I want to do, and so I'm trying to do kind of a, a, a nod to them at the Savage Worlds Game Master Weekly Hangout that became the Savage Master Weekly Podcast, uh, Savage Worlds Game Master Podcast. But at the same time, I just wanted this to be a little more family friendly and approachable, especially when I have a teen audience in mind. So remember that RPGs aren't stories until they're played. So you, as a group, agree on the world you're going to play in. And make sure that everybody agrees on the kinds of characters they're going to play, so that way you have that, that character creation time, that time to work and build characters that are synergistic with each other, that fit into the world. There's, a, there's no problem in saying no to the characters that people propose. So... Then we're going to look at the scenario. That's what you create as the game master. You're going to give the scenario based in that world to your players, and their players are going to have their characters respond to the world. And those responses are going to cause the world to react. And then that's how story happens. That's what creates story. So what are the building blocks of a scenario? How do we build a scenario? We start off with a hook, which is the way that the player characters are made aware of the thing they need to solve. We have an event that is the thing that the player characters need to solve. There's a perpetrator who did the thing and they had a motive for doing it. And ultimately there's evidence pointing to these events, the perpetrator, the motive, and there's an option of a twist. So, there, the hook types could be a higher authority, meaning somebody higher in the social structure or in the group structure or something like that. So if it's your knight commander, if it's your, if it's a corporation that hires you, if it's a business that hires you, if it's if it's a 
village blacksmith that you know really well who hires you if it's some if it's the king who commands you or if it's just your job you work as a corporate fixer and so that's your job whatever it is somehow it came to you through normal job resources um it could be an existing contact some that you've that you owe a favor to or they owe you a favor and now they're going to owe you an even bigger favor whatever it is you already know the person and you therefore your characters therefore will know the package this person comes with but they are, are going to help out anyway because of a moral or personal obligation it could be somebody from high society somebody with a lot of money somebody who's a political power or something like that that is hiring the 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 heroes to solve a problem for them it could be a stalker it could be it could be shielding from a political rival something like that it could be a referral from somebody of those previous categories or it could be a stranger a total stranger your players right into town and the the local fishmonger comes up and says look i don't have any money but my daughter's been kidnapped can you help please you look capable of doing this and we've we've seen these kind of things before in, in games and role-playing games and computerized role-playing games and stuff or it could just be happenstance like jack ryan when he takes down the ira terrorist um in patriot games which was actually written before hunt for red october but that just was happenstance that he happened to be there but in hunt for red october he sent out on the mission because his job initially is to just be an analyst to go over and advise on this new on the red october with its new caterpillar drive that will propel it across the ocean but without any screw noises or anything like that so that's that's something there now what kind of events can you have happen you can have a theft of something you can have somebody threatening blackmail somebody threatening extortion or extorting you can have a missing person somebody just was supposed to be there but now is missing uh, one of the best one of the best um Philip Marlowe stories is based on that idea of a guy gets out of jail, goes to see his girlfriend and she's no longer there. And it's not even the same club that he used to go to. And so he kind of gets Marlowe to do the investigation for him. It could be a murder. Murder is a good classic one. Um, it could be fraud. It could be a kidnapping. It could be arson. It could be menace or a framework. I, I, I put those two together as the same kind of thing, because if, somebody else is menacing the the client then the client is going to be asking the detectives for help because they're being framed for something they didn't do and or it could be a vetting the the client is actually just checking to see what or, or how the detectives perform before actually hiring them for a real job or it could be vetting them for somebody else so there's different kinds of perpetrators that we can be having do these crimes that are against the client or whomever they, they could be a relative a friend a business associate a corrupt official or a criminal somebody who's in direct competition with them somebody who's just an outsider to this whole scenario and they're doing it for kicks and giggles or they have another motive of their own maybe they like look at murder inc murder inc was a great example of how to of, of how to have somebody who's a complete outsider who has no ties to that community come in and kill somebody and then leave or they could be an outsider looking to get in and they're asking for your gumshoes to help that or it could be organized crime that did the that's doing the the hard part and they're asking or they're trying to do something against this client it, whatever it is this there's somebody who's doing something now what it, the perpetrator i'm going to take just a moment a brief moment more here and that the thing is is that a story is when somebody wants something badly and somebody doesn't want them to get it that's a story that's conflict and these are the people in conflict the antagonists or the villains full-on villains who are trying to stop the heroes or the client from getting what it is they want and why are they doing it it could be simple greed or for political gain revenge love that's one of the oldest ones out there 
It could just it could be to learn something. It could be for knowledge of something or something that the client has or something that they think the client has. And it could be just for survival. And some of those survival types include um, financial, political, social, um, physical, or legal survival. Now, there's three main different types of evidence. Physical, testimonial, and documentary. Now, um, I have it down in the corner. Unfortunately, it's behind my, my picture and frame. But um, there's a website called The Alexandrian. He wrote a book just recently called So You Want to Be a Game Master. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it. But one of the things that he does is he has, a, in 2008 he put this out, a very good document, a very good article on the three clue rule. When you're giving these types of evidences, and you can have multiple of these types of evidences, and I would recommend that you do have at least one of each of the three types, and or you know depending on how it makes sense for the event or for the scenario. But when you are giving the investigators clues, when you're giving your player characters clues on how to move forward in the story and making the story, make sure you give them three clues three clues every single time and they could be all the same type or one of each type or whatever but if you say that the haunted castle on the hill is where the princess was taken by the evil warlock morden and so morden's got princess lily up there in the up there in the castle and it's and it's haunted so you don't know how he's getting in and out but you do know that it's up there and so you've got to go to that haunted castle up there so you or you want the player characters to go there so what you're going to first find is maybe maybe there's a ghost that they a, a ghost that ran that has escaped from there and is attacking the city and maybe that's one of your clues and that could be kind of more of a physical clue, although it's not physical. But that's that's beside the point. That's it could be that physical is is the ghost clue. But there's also a a testimony from the old man who who nearly died of fright, or who had a spell cast on him that the spell's just wearing off. And he's like, yes, I saw Morden taking Princess Lily up to the castle up there. So that's a second clue. A third clue could be that. You find a release paper for Morden from the jail and they gave him back his wand or something. I don't know. Whatever it is, you are going to now have the player characters heading up the hill towards that castle. Now, could they roll? Here's the other thing. Give them all three of those initial clues without rolling. Make Give, the, give it to them without them having to roll to find them. Then... You can give additional clues to that they can roll to find. So they can do their search rolls, they can do their notice rolls, they can do whatever kind of rolls they want. But they need to have at least three clues because if you're not smacking them on the head with the clue by four, as um, one of my podcasts that I listened to said, if you're not smacking them with the clue by four on the head at least three times, they might not get it. They might grab a red herring and chase that all the way down its barrel, and it happens. So make sure that you're doing that. So your physical evidence are spent shell casings or they are knives or they are footprints in the dirt. Something that points to the event or part of it. And because it, it might not be pointing to the event itself, it might be pointing to a stalker, somebody who's been stalking the princess and you don't know who because this report was given a while ago. So that would also lead into maybe some documentary evidence as the local town guard has had a complaint or the, the king's guard had had a complaint from the princess saying, I think I'm being stalked. And they were able to do a little investigation, but they couldn't find anything. Um, then you can go talk to the, cap the, the captain of the guards and say, what happened here? And he's like, we couldn't find any evidence. All we found was that one muddy footprint and we couldn't find anything further. And he could authorize them. He could deputize them. Something like that. And you see how story just spins out of this or the event builds out of this and the player characters can now spin this, help you build that story out of it. 
So some of the twists, if we look at the twists real quick, the sixth type or the sixth step is could be betrayal. Like the, some the the client stabs the investigators in the back, and or it could be a double blind that the villain that we think we have is actually not the real villain, or is the front for the other villain, and it could be on purpose. It could be a patsy. There could be a hidden motive, and the the client has the trouble being investigated on false pretenses. It could be a dark secret. The client's hiding some dark secret about their past or the other aspect of their life. And it could be a case of mistaken identity where the client, the subject who turns out maybe not to be the villain after all, or even one of the investigators is the other person. And then it could be just a tangled mess of all these twists. You could have two twists and that could really lead to some fun, some fun or evil stuff. So, um, different kinds of betrayals can happen. There could be the accidental betrayal, as in the bad guys do get a hold of the of the client and they start torturing them, and the and the good and the the client spills the beans. Just bleh. it could be accidental. It could be that the that somebody in the group did something in the past to like okay, as one of my favorite examples. Um, when the heroes save the bank from being raided while the apartment building burns down and old granny out there dies in the fire, well, maybe grandson or granddaughter, in order to get revenge on the players, will pretend to hire them just so they can get revenge and get them destroyed. Or, or maybe it's revenge of their own personal motives. Um, it could be out of self-preservation. They, they betray the heroes out of self-preservation because it, it could be that the heroes are going to be finding out that, that I mean, this, is, this is one that links very well with Dark Secret. But, it could be, but there's some sort of self-preservation going on. And it could be doing something for the better good. They, or they think they're doing it for the better good. They hired the heroes and they're going to betray them because ultimately the, they, the heroes are on the side of the wrong and now they're doing it for the greater good. So whatever it is, that's kind of the betrayals you're going to be looking at. Some of the hidden motives could be a distraction. They're, they're having the heroes do it to distract them from something else that's going on. Again, the bank robbery being perpetrated by the villain's, bad, by the villain's mooks at the same time that the apartment fire is going down. It was also set by a villain mook. Which one do they choose? It could be a snipe hunt. They're out there looking for someone or something that doesn't actually exist. I used to love sending kids when I was camping as a kid, um, as, a, as a teenager, and the little kids would come around, and they, they were kind of being pests, and we didn't really want them hanging around with us. So I'd be like, go ask your uncle if he's got a cup shaver. I need a cup shaver. Could you go get, find that out? The kid goes over to the uncle, and the uncle's already, the whole life, already been in on this. Cup shaver? No, no, you know, I, don't, I don't have a cup shaver. Go ask your dad if he's got a cup shaver. And the kid will just zigzag all around camp, burning off energy, not annoying the teenagers, and at the same time, only mildly annoying the adults who have all been through the same snipe hunts themselves. Um, it could be a bait and switch. They one of the, they brought them in under one pretense, and then now they're going to have them do the other pretense. Or it could be just a spoiler because um, their hidden motive is just to get the get the heroes out of the way. So other types of dark secrets as well. These dark secrets can also be talked about here. You, they could be silent partners that they're trying to keep out of the detective's notice. It could be bad blood. It could be a sibling. It could be someone in your family or in the character's families that's doing this whole thing. It could be setting the, the detectives up as a patsy to take the fall. Or it could just be that the, the, the client is guilty of the crime that they're having the other, the other person investigated for. Whatever it is that your characters are investigating, this is important because they need to help you make the story. And now that you've made your story, you guys can look back on it and remember it and be like, that was really cool. Now, is everybody going to be 100% in the game, in their head in the game, paying attention at all times? No, because sometimes we're tired. Sometimes we're sick. Sometimes we're 
hyped up on too much caffeine and sugar. Sometimes we don't have enough caffeine and sugar. Whatever it is, expect that even your best blade, even if it's a one sheet and a one shot, and just going to be a four hour go, expect that it's going to probably end up crashing and burning. So understand that there's more ums and where are the Cheetos than there are actual game moments. And it's okay because really the story isn't the reason why you're here. It's your friends. It's your community. It's your group that you are with that you love and they love you. And they're here to support you. And that's the reason why I created Ace Roleplaying Games Clubs. Because between the ages of 13 and 15, I wanted to unalive myself. And I really didn't have the support system except among my role-playing game friends and playing role-playing games with them. That creative outlet is what helped me make it here today. So I just want to thank you for joining me for this. And I want to thank you for everything that you do for me and remind you that I love you. You're amazing. And this world is a better place because you're in it. I look forward to meeting you in person and I look forward to having you at my table. So until next time, this is Mason Emerson with Ace Role Playing Games signing off.